Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 63, The Mixer. Games for a game night with gamers and non-gamers. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and live from Windsor, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, in this game recommendation episode, I will be recommending games that are great for a game group that's a mix of gamers and non-gamers alike. I'm also going to do a wrap-up on this past weekend's Extra Life Board Game Blitz, and I'll be talking about Endeavor and Anachrony in the Week in Review segment. And I got Duke back onto the table with my son. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. All right, up first, a couple comments from our gateway to area control topic from a couple weeks ago now. Up first, I got Gene Chu has a game suggestion, one I haven't actually tried myself. Gene just writes, I like Discworld, Ankh, more pork. Well, thanks, Gene. I didn't even know there were Discworld games, but if they're half as good as even the worst of the books, I'm in. Now, Cindy Robertson has another suggestion. I would add Ethnos to this. It's really easy to pick up for new players, and there are multiple strategies based on which races are available. Well, thanks for the comment, Cindy. Uh, There's another one I haven't actually tried. Uh, seems I'd need to play more gateway area control games. That's two right there. Now, Ethnos came out 2017. It's got a 7.5 on BGG. That's pretty dang high. And a weight of only two. So this sounds like a solid gateway area control game. Or Area Majority. That's the one I'm not sure which side of the fence that lays on. Now, Sam left a couple of comments on one of our earliest Gloomhaven videos where we were doing a two-player random dungeon. Sam had two comments. The first was, you actually ripped the card! (laughs) Yeah, uh, we are actually destroying my copy of Gloomhaven as we play it. Uh, To me, that is a necessary, vital component of playing a modern legacy game. The thing is, when you destroy a piece of your game, you have added permanence to the game that couldn't exist other ways. Once you've ripped something, there's no going back. You've made a decision. You're going to have to live with it. Now, Sam A. also commented, I forgot to mention the thank you for the video. Laugh out loud, I'm a newbie to the game and was looking everywhere for some extra information on how to do your own dungeons. I'm really looking forward to setting up a few for my party. Well, thanks, Sam. Looks like Sam was trying to get his feet wet with some random dungeons before they get into the legacy play, which might not be a bad idea to get some practice with the system and work out some of those kinks in advance. Now, our final comment comes from patron Jeff Seuss. It is in regards to our weekly wrap-up for last week, where Mo and Deanna attended Jeff and Sheila's wedding. Congratulations again to both of you. Jeff writes, I'm glad you enjoyed the wedding and played some games and chatted up my role-playing gamer friend. We wanted to find the right balance between having games there, but not making them dominate the event. And I think we did. Well, first off, thanks for having us, Jeff. Uh, I gotta say it did. It worked out really well. Uh, While there was gaming to be had, there were games there, there was no pressure on anyone to actually play games. It was just another part of the celebration people could choose to take part in if they wanted to. And some people did, and others didn't, and that was cool. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thanks to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. We start Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern, here on Twitch love people who drop in and take part in our chat room at the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell for the after show. So we've uh, been chatting a lot about the uh, wonderful roads of Canada <laughs> so far early today. It's a light chat room, but uh, always pleasant to have anyone here. Thanks for uh, Jeff, Ryan, and Tech for dropping by and saying hi in the chat room. 
All right. Well, today is going to be another board game recommendation episode. We're going to be talking about games that are accessible enough to be fun for new players, but still have enough meat on them to keep a longtime gamer interested. So as usual, what I'm looking for the chat room to do is to point out any games we missed, anything I hadn't thought of or Sean hadn't thought of. I'm always looking to put new games. And if you do have a suggestion, we will be throwing that in the show notes when it goes live on the podcast. So everyone will get to see your game recommendations. We'll be checking back in the lobby a few more times during the show. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way to get questions in is to go through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. And our question list is getting shorter after every week. We haven't gotten any new questions for a while. So we would love to see some new questions rolling in anytime. Today, we have a question from Samantha Bryant, who asks, What are some of your favorite games when you've got a mixed crowd of mundanes and gamers? I'm looking for things that are simple enough that they won't overwhelm noobs, but interesting enough to engage gamers in the same group. Well, thanks for the question, Samantha. So first off, quick note, I do prefer the terms gamers and non-gamers to using terms like noobs and mundanes when talking about people who are either new to the hobby or just haven't discovered the joy of hobby board gaming. Now, I get it that there it's a thing, right? Like the whole muggles and Harry Potter and mundanes and ska and so on. But I personally worry people are going to find these terms somewhat demeaning. And that's not something we want to make a new gamer feel. And let's be clear, muggles is a demeaning term in Harry Potter. It's uh, generally said either thoughtlessly or with negative emphasis. And its root, as told by uh, Rowling herself, is a British term, mug, for someone who is easily fooled. So, But getting past the terminology, we get it. What do we want from a game that's going to be good for new and old gamers alike? Now, we've talked about gateway games many, many times on the show. Uh, for good gateway games... What we want to do is find something that's accessible, something that isn't overwhelming or intimidating, something that's easy to teach and that doesn't have too many different mechanics. So there's generally a focus on one or two core mechanics. And then we also want something, we probably want something relatively short. You don't want to tie someone down for an epic game when they're not that experienced with board games in general. And one thing that might shift your thinking, depending on your friend group, is the kind of non-gamers you have. Some people are non-gamers because they don't or haven't played, not because they can't or aren't interested. Mm -hmm. That one friend who does the New York Times crossword puzzle in pen over a cup of coffee on Sunday mornings <laughs> may have never played Power Grid, but they still might kick your butt doing it. <laughs> Very true. I don't have Power Grid on my list today. To me, that, that's a little more advanced than I expected from the average non-gamer, but very true. So... While you've got approachable, easy to teach and learn games and quick games are great for new gamers, based on Sam Antha's question, we also have to worry about keeping the experienced gamers at the table interested. So now we want to find a game that not only has those other qualities, but we want something with some weight and engagement. We want games where strategy and tactics matter, and we want a game with meaningful decisions. Basically, we want everything. Give us it all. <laughs> Detail, ease, complexity, straightforwardness, great for young and old. Now we're going to try to get to these are probably the most generic game suggestions out there because of this, because they're going to appeal to the widest audience. And thankfully, there are a number of games out there that fit all of these criteria. Now, these are going to be my suggestions for great games that appeal to both new gamers and experienced gamers alike playing together at the same table. So first up, Monopoly. No, I'm just kidding. I no. will not do that no. to you. <laughs> first no. up. Imhotep, Builder of Egypt. All right, since getting Imhotep, I have played this with a wide variety of players at different skill levels, and everyone so far has enjoyed playing it, uh, from the experienced gamers to the brand new players. And I have literally seen both at one event, at the Easy Mode events we've had. Uh, now, Imhotep has an added bonus over many of these games of having a second side to each of the player boards in the games. Now, these B-sides are actually a bit more complicated and allow more tactical and strategic play, and thus will more appeal to the, the hardcore gamers, the experienced gamers. So what I recommend is start off with a group of mixed gamers. You're going to use just the A side in one game. Now, this game's short, like half an hour short. You're probably going to have time to play multiple games. So you play that first game on the A side, and the next game, 
throw a couple of those B-sides in, and that'll keep the interest of the more experienced gamers. Yeah, and you know what? I see a lot of buzz on Amatep right now uh, on uh, on board game Twitter. Uh, people are still seemingly discovering it, mm. and it is it is constantly coming up, and it is undeniably loved by every mm. person who mentions it on board game Twitter. It's it's really impressive to see that. And, and it's it, not a new game at this point. No, it's not, uh, and yet it seems to just have have gone under the radar just enough that uh, it's picking up steam now. But better late than never, I guess. And that was Imhotep, Builder of Egypt. Uh, next up, a perennial favorite, Carcassonne. Now, of all the classic gateway games, games that have been around for years, like more than 20 years, Carcassonne remains one of my strongest suggestions. It's probably the oldest game that's in this list. There might be another one that's close. I'm not sure which came first. I'll recommend this one over Catan or Ticket to Ride for classic games. The actual rules of Carcassonne are pretty simple. Place a tile, then decide if you want to put a meeple on that tile or not. That's pretty much it. It's the actual scoring that can be a bit difficult to grasp, especially the farm scoring for new players. But it's something players pick up after repeated play. Now, what I love about Carcassonne is that there's a lot more to the game than it first appears. And I found it's one of those games where players have eureka moments, where you're playing, they're playing Carcassonne, and then just all of a sudden something clicks, right? And they suddenly realize, oh, wait, I can steal cities from another player. Or they sit there and go, wait a minute, I've played this a few times. There's only like six cloisters in that entire bag, and four of them are out already. And they start doing the math. They're realizing there's only one tile that has a city on all four sides, stuff like that. And then once they have those moments, they adjust their strategies, and the gameplay evolves and actually gets better from then on. Yeah, and as well as that, not only that, but also the number of players changes that game quite dramatically. So if four people are playing at one time and, and three people sit down and play it the next time, it's going to be a different game yep. again because that math changes with the number of players every mm -hmm. time. Uh, and then, of course, you get all the various uh, additions that can come in there uh, for better or worse in some cases. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 you know, either amp it up or, uh, extend it or, uh, just, you know, give it that next little level of, of something where not everyone might have to, to worry about it, but it gives it that extra weight for the, the more experienced gamers. And that was Carcassonne. Now, next up, I think everyone knew this was coming to the list eventually. <laughs> Azul. Yeah, no longer my number one recommendation, though. I, I, I For a while there, if, if I had written this before playing Azul, it would have been the one on the top of the list. Note this list isn't in any particular order. It's just the order that came to my mind as I was writing up today's show notes. Um, Azul, for a long time, was my number one recommendation for a game that appeals to all gamers. Like, it's a great abstract strategy game that has appealed to pretty much everyone I've, I've taught to, new and experienced alike. I've yet to find anyone that hates this game Though I am now starting to run into, at least locally, quite a few players are getting a little sick of it because Azul was out at every event and everyone was playing it. Now, if you've got a non-gamer that likes tile laying games like Scrabble or anything else where you're trying to build patterns of tiles, they're going to dig this game. This is a great next step game, and there's more than enough depth here to keep an experienced gamer happy. I still strongly recommend Azul. It just locally we played it a lot, and I gotta say, Imhotep's just a little neater. There's a little more going on, and it's still got that nice tactile feel. So I actually now recommend Imhotep over Azul for a new group, but both are still great games. Yeah, no, I think Azul is fantastic, and again, we want to stress that this is uh, the original Azul, not Azul Stained Glass of yes. Sintra, which I would not recommend for nope. uh, non gamers at all. That's nope, that would, I that, would not that confuses them in a hurry. Um, but Azul, absolutely, it, it's a really easily accessible game um not necessarily accessible in a ryan method because i know there are some tile problems and things that make make uh, it, it a little difficult if you don't uh hack i believe uh, yeah i don't know if i don't think you can feel the texture on the tiles yeah. in that way Sintra might be better but the the gameplay of Sintra, like Sintra is a great next step if you have a bunch of experienced gamers with a bunch of new gamers who are becoming experienced gamers and you get tired of Azul, Sintra is an interesting way to mix it up. But I also don't recommend it as an introduction game. No. So that was Azul. And next up, we have the king or queen, Domino. All right, with a mixed group, including new gamers, start with King Domino. It, it's dead simple. Uh, it, it's a very solid game. Experienced gamers are probably going to like it. There's going to be enough in there to keep them interested for a round or two. But experienced gamers are probably going to want something a little more. And that's when you break out Queen Domino. After everyone's got a good handle on King Domino, Queen Domino is much more of a gamer's game. 
Um, it adds invariability through building tiles. And there's a resource management aspect where you require players to spend and earn money through taxes during the game. Queen Domino also adds in a bit of take that mechanic with the dragon that experienced gamers should enjoy. Now, I do admit I'm basically telling you to buy two games. So that is the disadvantage here. Now, you could play Queen Domino and skip the building rules, but it's not recommended. Um, I wish they put out a copy where you just got both together. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like the way they're trying to market it. But if you're just going to get one, I do recommend King Domino. But like I said, your experienced gamers are probably going to have fun for three, four or five rounds. If it's a one game night thing, it's probably great. But if you're going to keep bringing it out, you might want to step up to the other edition. Yeah, I've really enjoyed all my plays of King Domino. It's a fun game, but I haven't played it that many times. Uh, and I can definitely see how if it was if it got to be too regular, you mm -hmm. sort of be like, oh, this again? Really? OK. Yeah. Uh, and so I and for that, I am looking forward to seeing Queen Domino. Hopefully they'll get the Queen Domino onto or sorry, King Board Domino Game Arena on, yeah. onto uh, Board Game Arena. So that was that was uh, King and Queen Domino. And next up we have Gizmos. All right. Uh, Gizmos are really any other gateway engine building game. So there's a series of these that have come out in probably the last five years. I don't know when Splendor came out, but Splendor, Century Spice Road, Century Golem Edition is kind of the progression. Splendor was the great game. Everyone was talking about it. Then Spice Road came out and everyone's like, oh, my God, it's better than Splendor. Then the Golem Edition came out and people are like, that's better than Spice Road. Of all those games, personally, I really like Gizmos. Something about that little the marble feeder I like more. That's the reason I listed Gizmos on this list. Personally, it's my favorite. But all of these games are great intro-level tableau building, engine building games that are easy enough to learn that even non-gamers can enjoy them. And there's just something about an engine builder as a style of game, something about where you start off with pretty much nothing and end up with a hopefully well-oiled point-making machine at the end of the game that is just rich, really rewarding. Like, I love engine builders in all types of game. And these are some great gateway ones. It's just that feeling of accomplishment that I built this thing out of these cards and I did it and I have this thing and it works. That feels so good. That's why I put this on the list. And I, while, again, a lot of these games do the same sort of thing, one of the major benefits about, of Gizmos that we've talked about many times is really how it displays. You know, it's, it's hard to debate the fact that this game looks cool, looks fun, and attracts attention and gets people interested in the concept of the game just by the very marbly, towery concept yeah. of the setup, um, and, and makes that that intro less painful because yes, it's it it it's not the easiest game in the world, but it's fun because it's marbles. So sure, show me what show me how to do this. You know. Plus, I find people dig the theme of the whole science fair, building a Rube yeah. Goldberg machine at a science fair. That's very accessible to people. Versus Century Golem Edition, what are you doing trading power cars in an Asian bazaar to power up your golem car? I don't know. So that was Gizmos, and next up we have Chocolatiers. All right, I have found the theme of building a sampler box of chocolates is a pretty dang easy sell to gamers of all experience levels. This is one of the games where whenever I've been playing it at events, which has only happened recently, we have people come up and get into like, what is that? Are you building chocolates? Are those real chocolates? Which is part of the presentation. They're glossy. And yes, man, you should have a box of um, or a C-cord or I, I don't know what the box of chocolates in the U.S. would be. But the, you should have those while playing this game because it's going to make you hungry. Um, people are just drawn to this game because of the theme. Now, this is another game that I think like Carcassonne has some great eureka moments in it. Everyone I teach this game through comments. Like partway through, they start playing like, oh, and then they're like, oh, wait, there's a lot more going on here than it first appears. Because you can just play the game trying to make your little nice box of chocolates for yourself. But the game really starts to shine when you realize it's even more about watching what the other players are doing with their candies and adjusting your strategy based on what everyone else is doing. But you can just do your own thing and still be able to play the game effectively, which is why I think this one would be so great for a table of mixed gamer experience levels. Yeah, and I actually don't think the Chocolate Tears is a great gamer game, but for this kind of mixed gaming, I think it is great. Uh, one of the big problems with Chocolate Tears that a lot of people uh, talk about is that the it's not a really great strategy game. There's a lot of ramness is in there. There are some complaints about some certain uh, rule aspects of it, and I think this could this can wear quickly on a, a group of hardcore gamers. But when you get that mixed group in mm -hmm. there, is where it really is going to shine. I think that's sort of like 
the, the, the ideal placement for this type of game. That, and as Ryan is mentioning in the chat room, why is there not a real chocolate version of No, there of really this? should. I mean, like, they'd like, they make chocolate Catan. Why is there not a chocolate Chocolatiers? <laughs> I, 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 we should make one. Like, yeah. like you'd, you'd, we'd, we'd have to go to like Purdy's Chocolates and yeah. like get a list of the six different chocolate types and how many you would need yeah. to do it. But yeah, there definitely should be a, a legacy version of Chocolatiers. <laughs> Absolutely. So that was Chocolatiers. And next up, we have Sagrada. Yeah, this one's come up a lot, it seems, recently. This I, I think I'm liking Sagrada more and more the more it comes out. Uh, it's a dice-drafting, stained-glass, window-building game that's both elegant and beautiful. Uh, each turn, you're going to pick two dice and put them on your player board. That's pretty much it, right? But you got to make sure that dice touching each other don't have the same color or the same numbers. And i got to say, that is way harder to do than it sounds. Um, then you add in these tools that are randomized every game that let you break the rules. And then a variety of different player cards, so different windows that you're aiming for. And you have a great game for various difficulty levels. The one that I really like in this game for new players versus experienced players is you get windows. You draft windows at the beginning, and they have difficulties on them. And for a new player, you just recommend they take the easier windows. Now, by taking the easier windows, their pattern's easier to make, but they get less tools to use. But in a way, that's good for a new player because they shouldn't need the tools because their window's easier. Whereas an experienced player can take that difficult six-star card that's going to be really hard to place their tiles and be challenged and be able to compete with the easier player. And I think it's really neat that way that can work in that game. And the rules are simple enough that, yes, a new player could also start with a six window and potentially win. But it's that option of, hey, if you're having a hard time with this game, pick a really easy window to start. And then you don't have to worry about the tools as much as everyone else. I really dig that. Yeah, no, Sagrada has come a long way. And again, if you're worried about group size, they do have a five and six player uh, expansion that came out mm -hmm. last year. Uh, and this game is a uh, wonderfully Canadian game that has really uh, been showing some staying power, uh, power, and it's really well liked. Um, you know, there's not really too many people have negative things about this unless they're the haters. Um <laughs> Which they're always going to. It's too it's, random. There's, always there's yeah. dice. There's, there's always expect. there's always going to be haters. But I, I have yeah. to say this this game has a really nice balance of of both in likability and weight. Uh, and I still have never actually played it. One of these times. That's that's another Sometimes. one. That at some point, I told you you need an Excel file or something. I know, I know. Um, and so that was Sagrada. Yeah. And next up, we have Takedo. Yeah, this is one Sean and I have played a lot lately. Uh, what I find really cool about Takaido is this is a game that plays completely different with a group of new players than it does with a group of experienced players. Like, literally, completely, almost like you're playing two different games. Yet it works brilliantly with a mix of both, because both types of play are valid. New players tend to focus on the journey and the story and making sure they eat and making sure they see all the vistas, Whereas experienced players are all about making sure the other players don't get that thing they need, making sure they don't get that final vista or they don't get to go to the shop or they don't get to go work on the farm because they're going to need money by the last thing. It's a two, two very different styles of play. The game can be either totally zen or completely cutthroat, and it's just as fun played both ways. Absolutely. I mean, I play this game almost too much. Uh, I, <laughs> basically, I, I, a game every day and a half or so I, I play. Um depending on how all our schedules line up. Yeah. And the one thing that's really nice about this now, especially when you're adding Crossroads, and, and again, I, I don't think you should be playing without Crossroads, um, but when you add in Crossroads, you add so many possibilities. And then if you get in there with the sweet spot of three players, you have so many options to play, and they're almost all valid, potentially winning combinations. Right. Uh, and so... You can explore. And so what I do, because again, because I play it so often now, I'm, hey, I don't know if I've ever played with this particular character or I haven't played with this character in a long time. And the last time I did it this way and it, it didn't go so well, what happens if I do it this way? And you play through and, you know, maybe you get crushed and you get a, you know, 40 or you crush everybody else and you get an 88, you know, and it, <laughs> you, you're just not sure. And that's, that's one of the great things about it. So that a non-gamer can sit and enjoy and figure things out Whereas a gamer can find additional uh, interest and challenge mm -hmm. in the game just by trying something different. I don't know if I'd recommend Crossroads for the first play with a new player. 
this I, I think you need to learn what those board spaces do before you give people an option. Uh, see, I I found it frustrating that there was no option when I was in those yeah. early games. Uh, that that it was you know oh you're just you're stuck. I, I don't want yeah, to. Yeah, this. this is no this is useless to me. Why do I want this? Yeah. Um, so so that was Takedo, and next up we have Bing, yes. aka Bonanza. Bonanza. Uh, this is another tried and true classic. This is one I couldn't remember if it's older or not from Carcassonne. It's up there. They're around the same time period, just before the turn of the century, which always seems so weird to say, but it's <laughs> true. Uh, one of the great things about Bonanza is that every player is engaged every round. Because even if you don't have the bean or want the beans that are up for bid during a round, you should be paying attention to what the other people are offering or wanting so that you can better negotiate on your turn. This is also a great game for higher player counts, right? You can play up to seven. It might be eight. I think it's seven people at once in this game. It caters just as well to new players because it's simple to teach. Play the first card in your hand, possibly play the second card, put two games out for bid, beans out for bid. You have to plant everything by the end of your turn. That's pretty much it. Uh, this has been a staple at any public play event I've run just because it works so well with players of different experience levels and for larger groups. I can't, like, I. this was just in my kit. Everywhere I went, I had Bonanza in the box for a long time. And it sat on the shelf for a bit, I'll admit. And then we brought it out for my birthday this year in January, and since then it's been coming back out again. No, I have to say, Bonanza is one of those great games where you you can you can play it or you can not play it and just be there at the table throwing yeah. some cards around. Uh, and, and it's a lot of enjoyment. Uh, the, only, the only thing you have to watch out for is that uh, I think it's sometimes... The if you have too many non-players, it can sort of take away the fun of the of the players who are trying to actually you know get too involved. Yeah. Um, so that you've you've got that potential you can wa to watch out for. But really, it's just I mean it's a fun silly game. So even the the gamers are probably going to be having some fun and laughing it up during this one. It's just enjoyable. Yeah, it's odd that trading beans and talking about trading beans tends to devolve into laughter. Well, and I, I'm not quite sure why. It's like, the restriction. The it's it's the hand restriction because you're never worrying about sorting your hand. You're sorting your cards or or or, or yeah. trying to find the best balance. You're stuck with what you've got in that order, and that gives you a freedom to chat and enjoy and, and, yeah, and do whatever yes. because there's nothing else you can do. You can't nothing with that hand you can do except for what's coming Trade. up next. Yeah. Yep. Um. And so that is Bonanza, B-O-H-N-A-N-Z-Z-A. -A. Next up, Lanterns, the Harvest Festival. I love watching this game blow people's minds. Because in Lanterns, when you play a tile, not only do you get something out of it, but so does every other player. And that, new players are always like, what? Like, it, it really tends to shock people. Now, the secret to playing well is being sure you don't help someone else more than you help yourself on your turn. It's this aspect that keeps will keep the heavier gamers interested. That whole trying to optimize every play so that you're getting more out of it than anyone else. Even though the basic mechanics are pretty simple, it's a pretty dead simple game. It's play a tile, get some lanterns, then trade in sets of lanterns for points. You're going to keep coming back to this one just because of that neat interaction of when I play it, I'm not only helping me, I'm helping everyone else. Now, uh, when it comes to uh, the Emperor's Gift, is that a, is that a benefit? I personally found that to be one of those bloated expansions that made a tight game too loose and too open. I haven't played with Emperor's Gifts since the first time trying it. Okay. Well, there we go. So we'll, we'll, we'll take that one off the list. Yeah. And, uh, I, was, I was not a fan of what Emperor's Gifts added to the game. All right. Uh, and so that was Lantern's The Harvest Festival. And next up we have Endeavor, Age of Sail. All right. Now, in this case you got to worry about the intimidation factor. So hide the box before people see it and all the extra exploit components, right? That's a, that's a variant of play that was added with the Age of Sail version. Or if you have it, just bring out the original Endeavor, not the Age of Sail edition. That would work. So if you're going to show a new gamer, hide all that stuff the first time. Because all those bits and bobs can be really intimidating. It looks like there's a ton of stuff in the box. But the basic game, the original Endeavor, is a very straightforward game. Every player is going to add a building to their town each round. You start with one, you're going to get more. The buildings are what determine what actions you can take. So at the start of the game, you're only going to have, in general, one choice the first round because you've only got one building. And then it's going to slowly grow as the game goes on, giving you more options. 
which is great because you have a nice tight focus and you don't have to learn all the things right from the start, which is very different from a game we're going to talk about way later in the episode today. But I love just how smooth, quick, and simple Endeavor is. It gets all that feel of an epic, uh, I would say 4X. Yeah, it's a 4X. You're doing all the 4Xs. But in Age of Sail times, you're getting that feel of an epic game in like an hour. It is so fantastic. Just take all the exploit stuff, which there's a ton of exploit stuff. Hide that away for a couple months, a couple weeks till everyone's got more experience and then maybe break it back out. Yeah, this is definitely one of those ones where you've got to sort of judge your crowd carefully. If there are a bunch of real lightweights, that this might terrify them away from the table. Yeah, uh, though it's not as bad as it looks. No, it's, just, it's, it's an not. intimidation factor. Absolutely. That's... Seeing this game is, yes. you know, where Gizmos is going to draw people in because it looks neat. This uh-huh. is going to make people go, I'm going to go have another coffee. <laughs> to be honest, I find Gizmos easier to teach than Endeavor. Yeah. Like, it just Gizmos is a more complicated game with more interactions than Endeavor is. Right. But it looks much simpler. Right. So that was Endeavor, Age of Sail. Next up, Ingenios. All right, swapping to not at all intimidating looking games. Uh, This is a deceptively simple abstract game. Uh, It's one of my favorite games to put it into tournaments, which just shows how tactical and strategic it can be. This is another game where you can just play perfectly fine after a quick teach. It's it's almost Scrabble-like. You get a bunch of tiles, you put the tile on the board, you score based on what how your tiles connect. That's it. That's pretty much the whole game. You're going to get one point for every match in color. Um, you're going to be able to figure this game out in seconds. It's really simple. But the more you play, the more you're going to figure out better strategies, the more experience you have. Now, the problem with this as a recommendation for experienced players versus new players is that the experienced gamer is probably going to win. They're probably going to trounce a new player. But this is such a quick, solid game that's very enjoyable to play and you feel like you're accomplishing something even if you lose that I can almost guarantee that new player who just got beat is still going to have fun. They're going to learn something from that game and want to play again and play better next time. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, to clarify, this is ingenious, not ingenious, because someone doesn't type too well, and I shouldn't. Yeah. I should check my games before I actually try pronouncing them. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's uh, spelled right the second. Spot. The second time it is absolutely. Yes. Uh, <laughs> don't try find. Don't try and find ingenious on Board Game Geek, but you can find ingenious from two thousand and four. So this, yeah, this one's going back a little ways. Uh, so that's ingenious. Ingenious. Next up, we have Takanoko. All right, one of the best things about Takanoko is its theme and table presence. Uh, we were talking about how cute games draw people in, or easy, easy to accept, uh, games that look easy to easily accessible draw people in. People are just drawn to the little panda miniature and the little gardener miniature and the beautiful wooden bamboo in this game. The theme draws people in, and it's simple enough to learn mechanics. There's only, uh, I think, four different actions you're picking from. None of them are too complicated, but they lead to a surprisingly deep game that will bring players back. Uh, This is enough of a game that's simple enough. I play it with my daughter, but there's enough weight here in strategy and decisions. And you are a master of most of your own destiny in this game, except for the random draw of the um, goal cards. That This is a game I don't mind putting in board game tournaments because I think you can be like the, the, the more strategic, more tactical player is tends to win without the random factors affecting it. So that's why I recommend this one. Yeah, no, Attack Oak was fun. I, you know, I, I played it for the first time uh, on, on Board Game Geek a few weeks ago, or Board Game Arena yeah. a few weeks ago. Uh, and it's just an enjoyable game with uh, a lot of a lot of presence. Even the digital version, uh, while not quite as cute and adorable as the <laughs> yeah. uh, physical version, is still definitely, uh, definitely fun. So that was Takanoko. All right, sometimes what you need when trying to get a new gamer hooked, right, when you're trying to get the new people interested is something with a theme to it, Uh, especially a theme that ties into something they already love. So our next two game suggestions do just that. They're games that I I wouldn't say steeped in themes, but at least have themes that are going to draw people in based on their love of an existing property. Yeah, so first up, we have Lords of Waterdeep. Now, if you've got a fantasy fan, a Lord of the Rings fan at your table, or a D&D fan, more specifically, that's becoming more and more common, this is a Dungeons & Dragons board game. So they're probably going to love Lords of Waterdeep. 
Now, while the theme isn't overly heavily integrated into it, what you have here is a great intro level worker placement game that's got plenty of depth to keep experienced gamers interested. Now, I will admit, they're, if they're huge fans of Kalis, they're not going to think Lords of Waterdeep's the second coming. It's not that great a worker placement game, but there is enough depth there. Now, after you played once, if you can get the Skullport expansion, that's what you can throw in that tends to hook the experienced gamers. They'll get a little more involved in that because there's a risk-reward system added to that that personally I think makes the game. I prefer to only ever play with Skullport. But if I'm playing with new players, I have no problem playing Lords of Waterdeep vanilla. Yeah, now, I do tend, I, I, do, I am the, uh, the disagreeing party here. I <laughs> don't necessarily agree that the theme is, is fantastic and wonderful and, and draws you in. But that was my experience with the game. Again, I still love the game. I just don't particularly saw, see the theme as as big of a draw. And again, that may have been how it was introduced. I don't know. Um, but that was Lords of Waterdeep. And next up, we have something that I'm a little more familiar with, and I completely <laughs> agree with. Harry Potter, Hogwarts Battle. Yeah, this is another one with a theme. So if you're trying to hook a non-gamer, you got a Potterhead at your table, here's one to break out. Because Hogwarts Battle is a great intro level deck building game it just teaches you the very basics of a somewhat random market but not overly random market and basic deck building and it has the added bonus of being cooperative and i probably should have more cooperative games on this list overall i don't because i'm not a huge cooperative game fan myself but they're always good when you have a group of mixed experience levels because this lets the experienced players use their experience to help the new players to work together and in this case defeat the forces of darkness and he who should not be named i gotta admit i was really impressed by this great introduction to deck building the only thing you got to watch for is watch for the difficulty to ramp up significantly at book five or so and then like max out at book seven so that is something to watch for if you're going to keep playing through it it does have a big difficulty spike yeah no absolutely but those first four uh, books, especially, are really great, really intro-friendly. Uh, and the nice thing about this game is it adds more components and, and techniques as you mm -hmm. move on. So the game learns with you. Now, again, unfortunately, there is that real difficulty spike, uh, which, again, we've talked about before. In a deck builder, it shouldn't be too easy to win. Um, so it starts off too easy to win, but it is definitely not too easy to win by the end. Uh, yeah. And, I mean, I taught this game to uh, one of your girls and a mm -hmm. few real gamers, you know, a few, few hardcore gamers sitting at uh, a table for your birthday, I think it was, or New Year's or one of those. New Year's. New Year's. New Year's. Uh, and so, you know, we had this on the table with non-gamers and gamers, and mm -hmm. I taught it to my kids, and they got, and they jumped right into it, no problem whatsoever. So that was Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Uh, and then my addition to this list would be the DC Deck Builder. Again, a strong theme game, but go with the Teen Titans pack. Uh, and I know a lot of people have agreed with me on this one, and I've heard this from a number of people. Um, while there's nothing wrong with the, the base DC Deck Builder game, the Teen Titans pack has a few fun little sort of mechanics uh, within it that just makes it a more enjoyable game, I feel, especially for the new, easier, newer gamers. And as a Deck Builder, Everything's right on your cards. All you need to do is learn out how to set up that basic uh, tableau of um, cards for the cards, and then everything else is on the cards from then on in. So it's really easy for everyone to pick up, uh, and it's reasonably casual too. If you're you know if you're chatting away, all you have to do is turn and read what cards are up, and you know what the situation is basically. I haven't played that particular one myself. Um, I think. I definitely wouldn't recommend Rivals. I think no. that's the one we played. Yeah, Rivals. Wow. Yeah, Rivals. Rivals. I would <laughs> not recommend for the newer um, yeah, non gamers. That was, that was rough. Yeah, there's uh, there's some real technique to that, and it helps if it helps if you know the uh, the games better. And that was DC Deck Builder Team Titans. All right. We're checking back into the lobby now. We've uh, got a number of comments going on here. So, uh, let's see. Uh, Ryan would like something a bit more than King Domino, but the Giants expansion isn't it. Yeah, I haven't checked out the Giants expansion. I gotta say, Queen Domino's good. I did notice he said something about it possibly not being accessible, so I'm yes. not sure. Yeah, so Queen Domino isn't, isn't uh, very accessible, and I definitely uh, agree on that one. 
Um, I think it's uh, it's got some issues because you can't, I mean, without being able to see clearly, you'd have to hack the cards. But I think it wouldn't be too hard to uh, put some braille marking of some sort um, onto those cards to be able to 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 feel your feel your like, way through what the dominoes are. Because again, it, they're it's just dominoes. So well, the problem with king queen dominoes is not. There's also building tiles, and there's right. a whole bunch of different buildings that get overlaid on top. Right. So that's a bit of an issue. I could see it. Uh, let's see. We have uh, Brian Counter Cult, uh, Brian Counter Cult of the Old, uh, who is another blind game enthusiast. Enthusiast likes Gizmos. I'd say I worry if like you, you mustn't be completely blind because those marbles you'd have to do something to. Like they are nice bright colors. Hmm. Like Gizmos is good, but like there is no difference except color between those marbles. And now Ryan's saying that uh, if he's involving colored dice placement, he'd rather play role player over Sagrada. Um, I could see it, but I, I can't see that being a great intro. Yeah, I, I don't know. Again, team, if you've got D and D players, if you got a bunch of people with at your table and some are experienced, non-experienced gamers, and they know D and D specifically, you're like roll three dice for strength, con, and so on. Role player would work. I could definitely see that. No, I, I definitely agree that uh, it takes that it it does require that buy in on D and D in order for it to be easy enough to yeah. Um, but like if you understand concepts like alignment and wearing different pieces of equipment and being able to equip only one handed weapon or a two handed weapon or two one handed weapons, it's those little concepts that I think are difficult for a new gamer. But nowadays, so many people have played RPGs, right? They played Skyrim if they haven't played D and D, that it's it's becoming more accessible. Um, I personally, I don't know. Sagrada is just so nice and pure. Role player is neat, but I don't know. I haven't tried the role player expansion. I like role player, but for some reason, Sagrada gets to the table way more often. Yep. Uh, Danielle, who joined us uh, a little bit later, thank you for dropping in, uh, was mentioning that if it wasn't already said, Concepts was popular when we had non-gamers at parties. See, the pro is that really that fun for gamers? That's the problem I have with Concepts. Like, I love Concepts. We've recommended it every time we talk about light games, party games, casual game nights. But I was thinking, like, when I hear experienced gamer, I'm thinking, you know, people like GMT games, people like heavy games. And to be honest, concept, to me, isn't a gamer game at all. It's a social activity. So to me, that's the game you bring out when it's all like gamers or you bring out when it's a party. And yeah, the experienced gamers may play it and probably even have some fun with it. But I don't think there's anything in concept that really appeals to a heavy gamer or an experienced gamer anymore. Like, I... I Code names. When I, I, as usual, I do research before writing these things or before doing the show, and I looked up a bunch of people's recommendations. And code names was on everyone's list, and I kind of get it because at least code names, there's there's strategy involved. Like there's remembering where your opponents have picked, and there's the tactics of the picking how many clues to give. Like I, I can see it. I just personally, again, to me, that's not something a heavy gamer is going to like. But to me, that's more of a gamer's game. Um, an interesting one is Pictomania that's from Vladis Shavatel, and it's win, lose, or draw for gamers. And what it is is that all of you are drawing at the same time, and you're all trying to draw different things. And part of the strategy is while you're drawing, you have to look at what other people are drawing, and you obviously know what you are, you're drawing out of the five clues. What are the other four people drawing? And you place bids on what you think they're drawing. It's really neat, but to be honest, it's so complicated that every nine gamer is going to be like, why aren't we just playing win, loser, draw, or Pictionary? Like, I don't want that every level of, I have to pay attention to what they're doing while I'm doing my thing. That's too much to think about. But like, for me, there's a gamer's game that is, is could work. But that's why I didn't get on the list. I also didn't put any dexterity games. Like, I could have easily had Gokuku on this list, right, as a game. But like, really, the experienced gamer is not getting anything out of it by being an experienced gamer in this case. Anyone could play that game. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's uh, yeah. When when you when you get into, um, I, I suppose the, the one argument I might have with that would be climbers. Uh, I think climber, yeah. climbers is one where you can get That's into it one. as a non gamer because it's not that difficult. The the, the basic concepts aren't that difficult, but mm -hmm. the gamer is going to be tearing their hair out trying to do all sorts of. Uh, no, I agree. Complex. That's a good call. That yeah. is a good call. Um. Uh, One that was way earlier in the chat, uh, Ryan, again, mentioned that an, another blind board game enthusiast has a mixed group of mostly non-gamers where they compare every new game to Secret History or Resistance Avalon. 
They seem to love social deduction games. I, I've said it multiple times on the show. I don't like social deduction. I know it's a thing. I know people dig it. Yes, I guess, especially resistance. There is strategy involved. It's not just lying to your friends. There's actually like there's deduction involved as long as there's actual deduction. Uh, another strongly recommended one, though I don't recommend it, is Sheriff of Nottingham for a game to play with non-gamers and gamers alike. But like I said, I personally am not going to put those on my recommendation list, but I'll definitely include them in the show notes because I know there's lots of people out there that love social deduction games, just not me. Yep. Well, and, it, and to be honest, it's the same as games like Cards Against. I mean, you know, a lot yeah. of people like it. Uh, we just find that there's a lot of better options out there that you could be playing. <laughs> yeah, like I said, for social deductions, your your resistance Avalon's the ones I like, right? Battlestar Galactica is a fantastic social deduction game, but it takes three hours to play, and I'd never recommend it for a new player. Um, there are in between games, right? There was oh, I can't even remember the name of the the one where you're on Mars. It was a Battlestar Galactica light Homeland, maybe if people dig it. Um, I haven't played Slew, so I don't know that. Uh, Ryan is. Asking Merchant of Venus, personally, I think there's way too much going on in Merchant of Venus for a new player. Now, that's a good one if you've got players who are okay with, say, Carcassonne, not Carcassonne, like Catan. Like, it, it, it's almost a good next step. If you played Kark, you played Catan, maybe even got them to play Power Grid, Merchant of Venus can be in that mix. But for a brand new gamer, I think it's overwhelming. All right. Well, that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice. Uh, if you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We need new questions. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so if you haven't yet, please take a moment to subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share with your friends. Whatever. And however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email that recaps all the content we put out in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, new YouTube videos, unboxings, reviews, and everything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the website, tabletopbellhop.com, and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Now, we are back on Twitch every Thursday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, doing some live streaming. We'll be playing some digital gaming or doing an FAQ read-through. You never quite know what you're going to get. All right, last week we did some eminent domain on Board Game Arena, where I got to admit I got a little too frustrated with the interface. I don't rage quit often, but I got really frustrated by that. The interface on there not working the way I thought it should. I was in a bad mood before we started playing. I shouldn't live stream in a bad mood. Uh, tomorrow, I think it's going to be more online gaming. Uh, Deanna's currently out of town, so I can't see what she's up for tomorrow. Just not Terraforming Mars and possibly not Edmund Domain again. <laughs> I don't know what else we have planned. Uh, the week after that, we've got to get that FAQ out, but yeah, yeah, we'll sit down. Neither of us have had time lately, so yeah. Again, the rough, edit, the rough edit's done. It's just a matter of getting all the uh, yeah. the rest. We just of the need to get to together it. and that's what we'll do tomorrow. I will <laughs> watch us live we're, stream we're live? editing a video. Yeah, there we go. Live live stream the uh, my my editing. Uh, <laughs> I wonder if people be interested in that. You know what? If yeah. there's something, there you go. Here, feedback. If you are listening to this or in the chat room, and you can think of something you'd like to see us live stream, let us know. Um, we we like I don't know. I, we're on Twitch. People like video games. We could play Destiny. We could play um, Star Wars: The Old Republic or something else. We could stick to just playing video games, or we could actually like live stream Sean editing a video. I, don't see why not. Anyone interested? I use uh, Resolve's uh, DaVinci for editing and uh, always happy to, I, I'm not I'm not an expert by any means, but I'm more than happy to uh, hey, I, I show would my love workflow. If we streamed, I'd love it if we streamed and someone who was an expert came and helped out. That'd be okay, great. And be like, get some tips and tricks. <laughs> hey, stop doing that that way. You could save 20 minutes off yeah, editing exactly. time. I'm that. all there. Although I have to say, considering I get most of our shows up now by... Uh, by like 1 a.m. the next tonight. Yeah. Um, I'm not too I worried about speed, mean, but yeah. uh, I, we, it could be better. I, I'm not going to admit that my edit is great. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a quick edit. All right. So uh, now that we're halfway through October, it seems about time about to start time reminding people about our monthly AMA. 
Yeah, last Wednesday of every month. We're going to keep trying to do this. The last one seemed to go pretty well. Uh, our first one went extremely well. So we're going to do this the last Wednesday of every month. Uh, that'll be hitting on October the 30th, um, Devil's Night. We will be doing an AMA. So start getting your questions in now or join us live the night of the show with your questions in hand. All right, all that is left on the road to extra life is the final destination, the main event itself, hitting on November 2nd and carrying over into the 3rd. This year's big event is held at the CG Realm at 1311 Tecumseh Road East. The store is going to be open from 10 a.m. on Saturday until 6 p.m. Sunday, November the 3rd. There is going to be a ton of gaming, board games, card games, CCGs, miniature games, and more. Besides open gaming, we've got an X-Wing tournament. There's a War Mahords tournament. There's going to be a silent auction running all weekend. A live auction, 7 p.m. Saturday. You want to be there for that. The stuff we got is amazing this year. And we've even got the local Artemis crew on board Saturday from noon to 5 p.m. where you can try your hand at being a Starfleet, sorry, Starship Bridge Officer. And of course, the cheat jars will be out all weekend. We want every one of you to join us. If you're local, please come down to the store. But if not, we will be streaming this entire event live at twitch.com, twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. Up next, we're going to do a recap of the Windsor Extra Life board game blitz that hit this past weekend. All right, first off, I know people are going to be asking, what's a board game blitz? So the board game blitz is a multiple round, no elimination board game tournament. Now, this format was created years ago for something called the Great Canadian Board Game Blitz, which was a circuit of board game tournaments held in prep for Fan Expo Canada, which is a big, huge event that happens in Toronto every year. Winners of regional blitz tournaments would get passes to Fan Expo, which is a huge prize, actually, a huge significant value there where you would go to Fan Expo and then on Sunday compete to be crowned the Great Canadian Champion or the Great Canadian Board Games Blitz Champion. Yeah, no, it, it's uh, it's tough enough to get into Fan Expo with tickets. Uh, yeah. so, and getting tickets is a whole other thing. Uh, but uh, if, you, uh, if you like crowds and geekery, it is <laughs> the event to go to for that uh, that sort of stuff in Canada, really. Yeah, and it's becoming more and more tabletop focused over the years. It used to be more pop culture, now tabletop's invading more and more of it, especially with the popularity of D&D and 5th edition and Critical Role and things like that. Now, over the years, I've hosted a few of these tournaments in Windsor, and they've always been popular. But unfortunately, the people behind the actual great Canadian board game blitz... Um, it fell apart. It fell apart. It's no longer running. The last one they did was in 2015. Um, basically, the head organizer decided he didn't want to do it anymore, and no one picked up the slack. So there hasn't been an actual Great Canadian Board Game Blitz since. But what I've done is taking the format, because I love the Board Game Blitz format, and I've run a few loads of Blitz tournaments using the original rules. Now, this won't have anything to do with Fan Expo anymore. We're not tied to them at all. It's just basically I'm using their format for my own personal events. Now, the last one of those happened this past weekend at the CG Realm as part of our 2019 Extra Life event. That's right. This is just another one of the steps on our way to helping the uh, sick children across uh, North America. So the way the Blitz works is each round, a selection of games are featured for that round. Competitors are going to pick which game they want to play. Uh, it starts off in random order, but then as you get further in the tournament, it's based on your player rank. From this selection of games, they decide what they want to play. And as games fill up to the max player count, which is three or four, depending on the number of people, the choices get limited. Once all players have chosen the game, the games get played. Uh, it's all following the rules right out of the box, no variance, no expansions. Players get points based on their placement. So many points for first place, so many, two so many points for fourth place. These points are then weighted based on the length of the game. So a long game... The two-hour games are worth 10 points for first, whereas a short game is only worth five points for first, as an example. At the end of the day, you're going to add up all your overall points, and the winner is the player with the most points, and we give awards for second and third as well. Nothing uh, nothing too complex. It's not one of your crazy math, uh, you know, tree tournaments where you need to nope. figure out your final 16 and count down to game day. So just simple math, and everyone can figure out up front, you know, 
you know, what they're going to do, how they're going to do, you know, based on, uh, you know, what game they're playing and what places they might come in, what their scores are going to be at the end of the round. Very true. Now, for Saturday's event, I ran a five-round event. Uh, it was two short rounds, two medium rounds, and a wrong round. Uh, we started with 10 players. We had a couple players join in during the later rounds, and we did have a couple players decide to leave during lunch. Now, this is allowed. If you skip a round, you just don't get scored for that round. And it actually is possible to, say, win the tournament by showing up only the last two rounds and placing first in both if other players didn't play so well. Overall, by the end of the day, we had 13 different participants. Now, I got to say, I, I got to admit, 13 kind of sucks. Like, that's, that's, I was very disappointed by the turnout. I think our biggest mistake, though, is we ended up putting this on the weekend of Canadian Thanksgiving, and that probably was not the best choice. Now, I don't know how we could have multiple meetings leading up to this, and no one went, hey, that's Thanksgiving, but hey, oh, well, <laughs> it is what it is. It was set and done, and we advertised when it was going to be, so we had it. Now, I got to say, though, those 13 players did seem to have a great time, and it was a fun event. We had a lot of fun. It went very well. I just wish more people were out there. You no, know, it's, you know, it's funny. The Canadian Thanksgiving is an interesting thing. Canadians take it seriously. It's not like it's yep. a, it's a fake holiday. Uh, like Chris Columbus Day tends to be in America. Uh, Indigenous we, Peoples Day. Is that what Depending it is? on what state you're in now. Oh, okay. Um, so frankly, it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, a big deal. It's it a is big our deal. Big, it is our big turkey day. But yep. that being said, because the majority of our media probably comes from the U.S., we don't necessarily think about it in advance. Yes. Uh, you know, we've, we'll have those family members who are planning the big dinners, but they always assume that everyone else knows about it. And uh, both myself and many of my coworkers were scheduling uh, work on mm -hmm. the Monday. Just casually, yeah, yeah, we're going to be flying in on Monday what? and doing this, that, and the other thing until fun finally somebody speaks up and says, um, guys, that's Thanksgiving and we have to reschedule everything. Uh, so yep. it's a common... It's, uh, Unfortunately, it is a common problem in Canada that you forget Canadian about Thanksgiving it. gets forgotten about until the last minute. It's, it's like a stealth holiday. Yeah. And it does, it's never on the same weekend, right? It has that problem too. Like it, it moves and I don't, I don't even know how it moves. That's <laughs> one of those things I don't understand. Like it's not like it's always the third Sunday or something. Or maybe it is. See, that shows how much <laughs> we know about it. But yeah, we love celebrating it. And it's a big deal. Like, And the other thing is most people, because it's a long weekend, tend to do multiple meals. Like with both sides of the family in most cases. Whether that's mom and dad or whether that's his and hers. Whatever that happens to be. Or hers or hers and his and his. Whatever that happens to be is most people tend to do stuff the entire weekend. Like it's a, it's, it's a big thing. Uh, thankfully for my family, we don't, we do things on Sunday and Monday. So Saturday is free, but I think for a lot of people, they were not free that weekend. So next year, lessons learned. So at the end of the day, Saturday, it was a, uh, player I never met before, which was awesome. Uh, Shumi Wang, who took first place with 33.5 points. Now Shumi needs to sit at a table with Deanna because my God, out of five rounds, she came in first for four of them in second once. Like, that was an impressive showing. Uh, now, Deanna Tuzano did follow with 28.5. And then Sean Hamilton and Qui Van, or Q, better known as Q, were tied for third, both having 27 points. Uh, there are three tiebreakers in the Blitz rules. They still tied after all three tiebreakers. If I was thinking what I would have done is just taken the third prize prize and split it in half and giving it to both of them but instead they decided to rochambeau for it sean won with a deft use of paper over Quee's rock well you just can't take the gaming out of a gamer that's for sure <laughs> so in total we did raise 66 dollars for extra life which is a unique amount when we were looking for five bucks a head but we did have some people tossing some extra money so thank you and i do want to thank everyone who took part in the event uh, special thanks to the people who were willing to teach games during the event. I highly appreciated that. That meant I didn't have to teach every game every round. That was nice. Actually, it worked out I only had to teach one game around. That was the one silver lining of only having the number, slow, smaller numbers we had. Uh, also, big thanks to the CG Realm for giving us a place to play and for topping up the prize pot. Um, the prizes was half of the pot, plus the store donated a bit more to up that a little bit, and we gave out gift cards. Absolutely. So I think, uh, you know, despite a lower turnout and uh, problematic di scheduling uh, issues, uh, there's definitely some, some good has come out of it. Now, if you head over to the blog, tabletopbellhop.com, uh, 
I do I did a much longer, more detailed wrap up. I actually shared which games got played each round, who won each of these games, and had a little summary of how I thought the blitz was going at the end of each round. I'm not going to get into all that detail here. Head over to tabletopbellhop.com and look for the blitz wrap up under on our tabletop. Now, what I do want to talk about here, though, is my overall thoughts on the event as a whole and kind of a look back, lessons learned. So the biggest disappointment for me, obviously, was the turnout. Uh, none of us realized we scheduled the event for Canadian Thanksgiving until it was way too late to change the date. Uh, we also had some problems advertising the event due to the limitations of Facebook. And what I got to do is move away from using Facebook. Yes, the Windsor Gaming Resource Group's there with 600 members in it, and it's been the best way to get a hold of people. But they, again, were limiting the number of people who could invite. I could only invite 50 people to the event myself, and they had to be friends. They had to be members of the WGR. Deanna had the same problem. We had people sharing the event, getting warnings, saying that I have limited attendance so that it would only be shared to a limited. I don't know. It, Facebook is trying to constrain things. And because I shared it, created the event as a group, it couldn't be promoted. So we couldn't even pay to promote it. So, you know, F you Facebook, I got to say overall, but hey, it's still the best way to get rid of hold of the most people. What I didn't think of until literally a week before was to put it up on Board Game Geek, which man, I should have done that way sooner because that's right to the target audience. So that's a lesson learned. Next year, I'm going to spend way more time trying to promote it on sites like Board Game Geek. I might even do the thing where I'll make a meetup account just for this where I'll make like an extra life meetup account and just list our meetup or our, our uh, road to extra life events. Uh, I just got to get the word out up there a little earlier in a few more places. Uh, meetup is not, um, not where people are going right now. Apparently they are charging. Uh, yeah. They charge even for a minimum account now. Yeah. So like, you know, like groups in Africa and things like that, there's, there's, there's protesting going on right now. Wow. Whereas, uh, uh, so meetup, the, the only way people are using meetup is a basic meetup where you can do for free, but you include a Google link to an actual, uh, <laughs> okay. an actual, an actual Google doc that, that goes through everything because, um, they are, wow. they, they have some poor business practices globally. Wonderful. Yeah. So unfortunately we don't have any good yeah, it's options right there now anymore. for what's out there. Um, hopefully somebody will step up. I said that it's driving me nuts. If there was a better way to, but anyway, get, get the word out earlier, better to more places. <laughs> Um, except for that, I think everything else went extremely well up until the last round. Um, I spent a ton of time before the event printing out board game rule summaries and player aids, and those really helped, uh, especially with teaching the game and for reference during play. Uh, it worked out well that every game had someone willing, able to, willing and able to teach it, which in some cases was me, but the other tables all had someone teaching, which was great. Um, that, that is of course the silver lining with a low player count. I didn't have to be at multiple places at once. So that was good. Uh, the games all went well. Um, players played competitively. Everyone seemed very congenial. Like everyone had a great time. There were no arguments. There was no disputes that needed to be settled. Like it went as well as I think it could have. Absolutely. Now, one thing I do have to watch for next time, though, is teaching times for the game. So over the years, I've learned one trick on Board Game Geek, well, many tricks on Board Game Geek, but the playing times on Board Game Geek are way more accurate than the playing times on the box or what the publishers say. And this is what I've always used when planning out any of these Blitz tournaments or any other game night when I know I have exactly so much time to get something done. But what I tend to forget is that the Board Game Geek time does not include any time for teaching. Now, that hurt Saturday, mostly in the first round, because the first round I was expecting to be lightning quick. And, like, I wanted to be, I wanted to get us ahead of schedule. Like, I, I planned the first round thinking, we're going to be done early, which will give me a wit, like a little bit of wiggle room for later. We didn't. We went over in the first round. And while the last round, two of the games took about an hour to teach, which just didn't work so well when you only allocate two hours to play. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's a real issue, and I mean, it's one of those things we actually talked about this in some way, to some degree, last week when we were talking about how you know, with fifty games being brought there, there's no mathematical way to teach all of those games. Yes, uh, but unfortunately, even with only thirteen people, you still run into some mathematical problems yeah. depending on how difficult the game is to teach. 
Well, from what I heard from people at the event and afterwards and people who sent me private messages and stuff, I, overall, reception was good. Uh, the one recurring theme we got, though, was that everyone thought the event was too much of a content commitment. Um, we got this from people at the event as well as people who chose not to attend and who I got rid of, a hold of after were like, hey, I thought you said you were coming. What happened? So it wasn't just Thanksgiving that was holding people back, or that was part of it, right? They could be tied up on Thanksgiving weekend, but not for 10 hours. So I think any future Blitz events, I think I'm going to limit them to three, four rounds maximum instead of five, possibly even cut out the dinner, the hour dinner break, because once you're there for that long, you need to throw a dinner break in. Whereas if I cut out a round, I might also be able to cut out that dinner so that we don't have to require people to set aside so much time to be able to play. I'm even considering possibly knocking it down to three rounds so it can just be a quick afternoon thing instead of an all day thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think there's definitely there's definitely ways to do it. Uh, and we were talking earlier, like there's even the potential of stretching thing, uh, you know, stretching things out into different days. If that works better mm -hmm. for people, uh, you know, do it a two day, you know, four hours on Saturday, four hours on Sunday and get everyone home mm -hmm. time for dinner on both days sort of thing. Uh, overall, I think it was a great success. It could have been better, but everyone who did attend had a great time, and we did manage to raise some money. Any money is better than no money. Hey, 66 bucks, that that's, counts, right? That's, that's, that's not a negligible amount of money. I would have liked to have been more, but I'm pretty happy with how it went. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back and see what, and summarize what's happened since we were last here, what games hit our tables. Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. All right, to start, uh, prep for the board game Blitz, I broke out Endeavor with my Monday night group. Uh, the goal was to relearn the game before the event because I was worried I was going to have to teach this one, and I hadn't played it in a year since I got the Kickstarter version. So on Monday night, um, we played with a full five-player count, and I guess it went very well. But heck, I'd say it went exceptionally well. It was good. I got to admit, I was rough teaching the game because it had been a year since I had broken this one out. But once we got things going, man, does that game flow smoothly. Yeah, no, and sometimes that's all you need. You really just need to get over that, that initial hump, even as the teacher, so that you're back into it and ready to go when you need to teach it. The newbies, mm -hmm. you know, in a in the next day. Now, by the end of our five-player game, every single one of the players had something positive to say about the game, including a player who did not enjoy it the first time we played. Uh, not only that, we all commented how we need to play again soon, while we still remember the rules before we forget them again, um, which is the base game. Because there is a bit of a learning curve to this game, mostly learning what the different symbols mean. And if we could play a second time, I know we would have made some different choices just based on how we thought things work and how they actually played out. What we really do want to try are the exploits. Now, I honestly don't know out of my set and the one you can buy on, say, Amazon right now, what you get versus what you don't. Because I did do the Commodore Kickstarter. But I know you get exploits. And exploits add an entirely new dimension to an endeavor, uh, both for one, making the game more historically accurate, but giving you more options. And I really want to try those out now, having played a big five-player game. Uh, overall, it was a great gameplay experience. Um, this was another game that really highlighted how much of an impact player count can have, because I noticed one player didn't enjoy it last time we played. We played with three players before. And I got to say, this playing with five was so much better, like, like miles above more enjoyable, more interactive, more cutthroat game than playing with three. So I, I don't plan to actually play Endeavor with three ever again. Like that's almost a count I would not recommend people play at. Yeah, no, it's amazing how many of these games just have that magic count that is a failure. Uh, and unfortunately, it does seem that three is 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 often that count yeah. uh, for you, a you, lot of games. Three for a lot of games. There are very few games that are really good at three. That, that, there's a separate blog post, good three-player games, because to be honest, there are not a lot of them. Um, the one ex exception we keep talking about lately, though, is um, Eminent Domain. Eminent Domain is actually best at three, but there aren't a lot of those out there. Well, Takedo is another one. Takedo with Crossroads, I would yeah. say, is, is with three is, is solid. Is the best with three as well. But um... so Endeavor also got played at the Blitz on Saturday. Now I didn't actually play in that game, but I was sitting nearby. I was actually teaching Gizmos at the same time. 
Um, and I watched a good portion of the gameplay. And again, uh, Deanna was the one that hosted this. This was with three players who never played before. And I, I noticed what, what's memorable is that it, we got a very similar reaction. All of the three new players were commenting on how much they enjoyed the game. And they really liked that there were a lot, while there were a lot of choices to be made, the basic mechanics were so elegant and simple. And they just combined in a way that flows very well and flows quickly. Like you're just, you're back to your turn very quickly, despite being three other players playing. It's not a slow game. It just flows really well. Um, both of these in this instances of Endeavor being played convinced me that I have got to give this game more attention. Like, I can't believe that. Like, I brought it out after getting the Kickstarter copy. We did an unboxing video, which I don't even think we ever released because it didn't go so well. It was one of the first ones we ever recorded. I played the game three player and we're like, oh, okay. Having now played, I'm like, man, I shouldn't have let that sit so long. All right, now getting back to the board game blitz. Now, when I host these board game blitz, I facilitate and I don't participate. because Mainly because I'm the organizer, right? Because I'm the one who's picked the games to be played. And all the games are coming from my personal game collection. I personally don't think it would be fair of me to take part and potentially win a tournament featuring games I've handpicked. So I spent most of the event teaching games and watching people play and answering questions. D plays, but he didn't actually pitch, pick it, uh, pick anything and organize. No. So, yeah. Yeah, Deanna, uh, we asked actually at the start of the event, we said, asked if people were okay with Deanna playing. She does not, she has input into what games are being yeah. played, but no, I'm the one that made the list. I basically let her look it over and then she'll point out things like I forget, like, hey, Istanbul is a race to get 15 gems and then it just ends. There's no second, third, and fourth place. It's just someone who wins. I'm like, oh, good point. Yeah, I got to take that one out. That's what she tends to help with. But yeah. We did confirm it with everyone if it was okay if she played. So uh, we do that every event. Now, for me, I watched and participated by teaching until the final round. Because in the final round, the games being played were Teotihuacan, Terraforming Mars, and Anachrony. Now, Deanna was playing Teotihuacan, was able to teach it. That's great. Um, and the group that chose Terraforming Mars were all players who were in second and third place in the tournament and all had played the game multiple times. So, like, they were good to go. They were like, here, take Terraforming Mars, go set up wherever you want. No one needs to talk to you until someone wins. So that left me to teach Anachrony. Now, I got to admit, I completely forgot how hard this game is to teach. Like, I even prepped for the Blitz watching a couple videos. But, man, what I didn't realize was how much I'd already internalized because there, we had a player there who wasn't a very experienced gamer. Like, they play a lot of games, but they just don't know a lot of different game mechanics. And while I think I did a pretty good job teaching, um, and I'm only basing on the fact that people didn't ask me a lot of questions once we started playing, and I didn't catch people making a lot of mistakes, it took a long time to get all the concepts and anachrony across. Now, I didn't have a timer, but I got to say, it definitely took more than half an hour, and it might have taken over an hour just to teach the game. And this is in a timed tournament, so that's a bit of a problem. Yeah, no, absolutely. When you when you get into uh, to timed tournaments, teaching has just such a a massive effect that certain games can be uh, problematic. Yeah, because the the problem with anachrony is how important strategy is, and by strategy I mean long term planning, right? Not what you're reacting to, but what your long term plan of the game is. And one of the first things you do, right, in one of the first turns of the game, I think is the third round of the game, is you have to decide what resources you want to take from yourself in the future. The game's about time travel. The thing is, you not only need to know what you need that first round, so what resources are you going to be short on, so what do you need, but you also have to be planning ahead so that you can pay those resources back in a later turn. That's the whole time travel loop. For someone who's never played the game before, this concept is not simple. This is not an easy, oh yeah, I get it. Like this takes a bit to grasp the fact that you're going to get what you need and the fact you're going to have to pay it back later is not something you see often in gaming. No, absolutely. There's there's so much of a um, act early for late reward in yes. the game. that, that And that's just tough for any non-gamer or, or even a gamer who's unfamiliar yeah. with that game. Uh, to grasp mm -hmm. um, that, uh, you know, in hindsight, that may not be the best uh, game for that type of a, a game, uh, unless you've got people who already know how to play it. Yeah. And then there's, it's worse than that, too, because besides that, there is asymmetry, right? So there's a big player board that everyone gets, and there is an A and a B side. And to keep it simple, everyone used the A side. 
But then you also have a smaller faction board, and the faction board has two sides. And then there's also leaders, and you have to pick which leader to use for the whole game. And that is literally the first decision you make as a player is which side of my player board am I using and which leader am I using? But you have to make that choice, and you've never played before. And this is, is so hard because every leader has a unique ability. And each of the abilities affects one of the six main phases. And you won't know what that does until you know the six phases. And then the faction board choice is based on a special scoring thing that happens about 75% of the way through the game, right? When the meteor hits Earth, you can now unlock this new scoring ability. So you're asking players at the very start of a game they've never played to set in motion a plan for something that won't hit until the last half of the game. Like for players to be able to make this decision in a tournament, I had to explain the entire game before we could start playing so they could make this an informed choice. Absolutely. It's 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 just tough to to be to need to cram all that information in before you can literally do the Take your first, first action of the game. Yeah. Because like most board games, as a teacher, I can usually say, let's just start playing and I'll explain this later. Right? You don't need to know everything before you make your first decision. Now there are parts of anachrony that are like that. Buildings and superpowers, I can explain as they come out. But everything else in the game needs to be taught up front, and man, that is rough. Like with a casual game, if it's not a tournament, it's fine. I'm just like, here, pick a faction, pick a side, we'll play through. You'll get to see what it does. And then next time you play, you'll probably make a more informed decision. I can't do that during a tournament, right? People care too much. All the people at this table care, right? Like put it this way, Shumi was at the table and she was in first place, right? So she definitely wanted to know, make an informed choice. Uh, like it was rough. Um, by the time I had gotten the group to a point where they were all comfortable with the mechanics of the game, they actually sat there like, Mo, you got to play. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, no, no, no. You just sat, you spent an hour explaining this game. You look excited about it. You look more excited about it than we're here. You're not needed in any other tables. They're like, you know what? Hey, sit down and play. And I'm like, all right. But what are you going to do for scoring? They're like, we'll just skip over you. So, because I got to admit, it's it's a game where I, I there's no real way to king make. Like, I couldn't make it so one of the other players is going to win or lose. So, like, fine, I'll play. So, why not? I actually got to play a game of anachrony while playing at the Blitz. Which leads to the really weird, ironic thing about Anachrony. Because after all that huge explaining and all those decisions, once you start playing, it's really not a hard game. Your initial choices at the start of the game are limited to public worker placement spots, and there's only five different ones. And your early decisions are straightforward. You're basically going to focus on building buildings or getting workers that you're planning to use in later turns. And most of that, unless your first player, is going to be driven by what the other players have done already. So unless you're literally the first player, you're kind of guided where you're going to go at the beginning. It's only once you build your first building that you're adding your own player board, that you're taking your own path, that that decision tree really starts to branch and the decisions get hard. At the start, I always find it striking how quick and enjoyable those first few turns are, like the first two, three turns, how quick and lightning fast and, oh, I'm just getting goods, oh, I'm doing this thing and that, and how that compares to how rough the teach is. Like, it's 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 a game where you, you feel terrible because you're like, don't trust me, it's going to be fun while you're trying to explain it. And then people are like, oh, wow, yeah, it really is fun. And yeah, the game gets heavier as you get further into it, but because it's a slow progression, you're just slowly adding one more building, one more decision point, maybe two buildings one turn, that by the time you get to the harder decision points three, four rounds in, you're prepared for it because you've slowly taken those steps up the ladder. It's one of the things I actually think is brilliant about the game. But man, that teach at the beginning. Yeah, it's it's that it's that cliff, right? You can't you can't get to the to the greatness of it without getting that data dump in there first yeah. to 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 preload everything. Um, you know, it's like one of those games uh, hooking up on your old PC. Once you get yes. it loaded into memory, it's great, but you got to wait until it's all in there before you can do anything. Yeah. So in this case, by the end of the game, all three of the other players did know how enjoyable the experience experience was, how much they liked the game. Um, people actually talked about going to find a copy of it. Uh, a couple players even noted, they're like, man, when you were teaching that, I was like, wow. I remember Paul, he wasn't actually playing, but he walked over to comment about when I taught him the game before. And he's like, that's the kind of rule book 
where if it suddenly said, and then you take out a fish and slap the player on your left, I wouldn't be surprised that that just, I'd be like, oh yeah, yeah, that's part of anachrony, um, which I thought was an amusing way to look at it. But like everyone who played it really enjoyed it. The other thing they all agreed though, and I thought it was funny, is like, there is no way in hell I am ever teaching that game. So if I buy this game, you're going to have to come to my house and teach <laughs> my friends how to play because I don't want to teach that game. I admit, I didn't even have fun teaching that game. Uh, basically what this told me about Anachrony, which goes the same with, with, with Endeavor, is I need to play it more. I need to play it more, but I need to play it with people who already know how to play. Because, man, it's such a good game, but, oh, that teach is so hard. If I could just remove that aspect, the overall experience, the whole game night would just feel so much better. It'd be, we sat down to play Anachrony, we played Anachrony, and it was great, and there was time travel, and I moved my mechs, and it was awesome. As opposed to, I sat down to play Anachrony, I explained what all the components were, I explained how time travel worked, I explained how the buildings worked, then I explained how time travel worked again, then I explained how these... No, like, I, I almost never want to do that again. Just too bad, because it's such a good game. Yeah, no, it's tough. It's absolutely tough. But, uh, now, speaking of time travel, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? So are you going to skip over your game for this week? Uh, oh, yeah, no, I did. Yeah, that's true. I did play a game this week, and I completely yes, forgot to add in it. Uh, my son to, uh, has been playing uh, Skipbo in the mornings with his, with his mom before, uh, before heading she off never to school. Played that game. Uh, and that's, 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 the, that's the, what the, the kids and mom play Skipbo. That's their, that's their game. Uh, but uh, someday Sherry's off to work early in the morning, and uh, so all of a sudden one night, you know, we'd, we'd had breakfast, and the, the day was ready, and, and we were sitting there, and all of a sudden he comes over and drops the Duke down in front of me, and I'm like, nice. really? I had to pull you out of bed this morning. <laughs> Are you really away? And sure enough, uh, he kicked my butt, uh, really? and then he kicked my butt again the next morning. Um, and we, they were good, solid games. I have to say, I don't, he's obviously getting better at it. Uh, he, and he actually even brought it to the table with one of his friends. Um, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't around. I know they played for like an hour and then finally, wow. and then finally gave up. So I don't know, um, if there were any issues with the game and, or how well he taught it to his friend, but, uh, uh, no, it was, yeah, he, he's really enjoying it again. So that's one of those things. It doesn't take a long time to play. In mm -hmm. most cases. So when we've got, you know, that 20 minutes or half hour before he has to actually leave for the bus, uh, aside from the fact that I clearly haven't had enough coffee yet in the morning, huh. uh, it's been a, it's been a great, uh, great little play. Whereas I don't think we could get a, a solid game of DC in before no, uh, the bus. Not. Yeah, I, the Duke's just so good. It, is. it, <laughs> it really, really is. is. Uh, and he's actually, he, he's, he's fine. He's looking at those King Arthur tiles. And 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 sort of finally get to throw them in I'm at like, some point. I I need to sit down and read through them because they're weird. Like they're yeah, not, they are. they're they very are. weird. So I need to sit down and figure it out. Um, but no, it's great. And it's great. You know, I, I've been having some great things. He's just literally been catching me in in corners. So nice. Yeah, no, it's been great. Yeah, we had the Duke in the Blitz for the final tiebreaker. So the rules as written are: if you get to the final scoring in first place, is tied. You play a strategic, short strategic two-player game, and I couldn't think of anything better than the Duke to throw out there. So yep. that was in there. That's that's the other thing. I probably should have got Sean and Q to play against each other, though they were tied for third. So according to the official rules, they they would have tied. But no, I we have brought it out fairly recently, Deanna and I again, and I'm like, yep, the Duke's good. And then we brought out Yarrow, and I'm like, no, the Duke's better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the Duke, and then War Chest. Those, you know, and the War Chest is yeah. different enough that. You know, it's a solid. Uh, it's a solid. Yeah, I almost well. put that on today's list. I, I, I couldn't decide if it how accessible it would be for a new gamer. Just because of the Duke, everything's on the tiles. I didn't put the Duke because it's two player only. And yeah, I, when I yeah. think table of mixed experience, non experienced, I don't think two players. Yeah, yeah so no, I, that could be a very interesting list actually. When you have two player games with an experienced player versus a noob, and what to make it so it's fair. Yeah, no, that, that, that might be an interesting topic. Though I, I can't think of very many examples. Without it just being highly random, right? So that the other player has a chance to win. Yep. Huh. Now I got to think about that one. All right. Well, while you're thinking, how about a look ahead? And what do you have planned for the coming week? All right. Uh, for those of you live, come to easy mode. Saturday, we're having a Halloween event. I realize that's not many of you right now. <laughs> but we are going to be doing uh, easy mode, Halloween, spooky game night. We got a whole episode about that. You can listen to our previous episode if you want some hosting a themed game night. 
where we talk about horror games. Uh, that's this week. Then the week after, we finally got copies in Windsor of Dead Man's Cabal. So I am going to host a demo night at the CG Realm from 5 to 10 p.m. on Saturday, October 26. You can come out and check out the Dead Man's Cabal from Pandasaurus Games. This is a game where you are a necromancer who decides to go to a dance party, but you realize you don't have any friends, so the only people you can call are your other necromancer friends. And then all your necromancers show up together and realize, well, you don't have any friends except each other. How the heck are we going to bring guests? Well, you're a necromancer, so obviously you have some rituals and raise your guests from the dead. The, one of the most unique themes I've seen in a game, one of the most unique presentations, you are drawing skulls from bags, you are using bones as currency, um, has one of the most obtuse end scoring systems I've ever seen. Uh, you got to play this one. Come out to CG Realm Saturday the 26th, and I'll teach you to play Dead Man's Cabal. And I need to be sitting down and working on uh, finalizing my setup for the stream when we get down there. Uh, again, I've got some some plans for some stuff I want to try out uh, differently than we did for the original stream, and, I, and I've got to see if technically I can actually make that happen. <laughs> they did uh, that, that whole messy table's gone, so that's okay. all cleaned up. So they've, they've done some work on the store already. So I expect it to look pretty good for that day. So I, my goal, and I, I think I mentioned this before, what I would love to do is I'd love to set up in the same place I, I was last time in that back corner, but yeah. I'd like to turn what was the cardboard table in yeah. and, and turn that so I've got three or four tables perpendicular to the rest of them. Oh, okay. And I basically do... what you meant there. Because um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to have like three cameras for three basically feature tables. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there'll be, you know, we'll have a wide shot and we'll see what else is going on elsewhere. And I'll probably do some roaming camera like I did before. But I'd like to have games that we could be playing with cameras specifically. When are you in? Thursday? For that. Uh, no, because it's, uh, it's Halloween, right? I can't. I, the, so the oh, first. Shit. Yeah, so okay. I was going to come up early and then I can't miss Halloween. So I'll yeah, be, I'll be down sense. on the Friday, which is the first. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I'll we'll, be leaving early. I'll we'll have so. to try to get in there on Friday and see what we can do. Yeah, Jeremy's sure. usually pretty good about rearranging stuff, but we'll see. Yeah. What I'll have to do is uh, remind, we got two weeks, but you have to remind me so I can get a hold of him ahead of time, make sure he'll be there when we get there. Right. We might have to do it Saturday, unfortunately. Well, because I, mean, I yeah. don't know how much that'll interfere with Friday Night Magic. Yeah, like that one table, obviously, will be fine, but it, yeah. I think we'd have to move two rows to be able to do what you want to do. Mm, so we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I my, my big thing is I don't want to run wires all over the shop and leave tripping hazards yeah. and stuff like that. Oh, so yeah, if I can obviously. turn those. If I can turn those tables and just use yep. that whole end of the, the store, it makes it uh, easier. The new and improved cafe should be open by then too. And they have a new and improved Coney dog that they've, I've been, I've been told I will love. So I haven't tried it yet, but it's, I, it's supposed I just to be think open. It would be nice if they had food there when we're going to yeah. be there for 24 hours straight. So. It's, it's supposed, the new cafe is supposed to be open by then. I, I have been told, I don't understand why it wouldn't be, I think was how it was worded. Right. I don't see why it wouldn't be. It was partially open where there on the weekend. So. Okay. All right. We're getting near the end of the show. Uh, I haven't seen a lot in the lobby, but Brian, or no, blah, Ryan had dropped out something. What did I see? Well, he was asking, what should we stream? That's what we were asking. What do people want to see a stream? What would you like to see Sean, Deanna, and I do? Do you like, it's not a podcast because we do this already. <laughs> it's not just the three of us chatting. I, I, I just honestly am asking, what would people like to see? Like, at this point, we're thinking we might just cancel it, and the three of us will do other stuff on two Thursday nights because it's not really getting us the views we had hoped. Yeah. Um, on a similar note, though, thank you very much to Mujin for joining us for our Gloomhaven stream on Friday. That was fantastic. Uh, learned stuff we've been doing wrong since probably day one in Gloomhaven, which is shocking that we're still making mistakes 50 or so games in, but hey. Uh, didn't see anything else in the chat. Not, not a lot going on. We got all the game recommendations earlier, so. Yep. All right. And now, a quick shout-out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Danielle Thomas. Thank you, Mage Kayla. Sean P. Kelly from the Excellent Gaming and BS Podcast. Thank you. Andrew Dacey. Thank you. Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Ma. Misdirected Mark, join Phil, Chris, and Bob every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. And I hope Sean has gotten the new computer that he ordered, because I know he was uh, his computer went down and they were doing all sorts of weird remote stuff on there. 
to their put to get their podcast out uh because he lost his system sean chris you mean no sean sean kelly from gaming bs oh gaming bs no, yeah. I hadn't seen that. yeah no his uh he his com- his that. computer died uh, and they were rushing around to try and get one in time and they didn't have it for this week oh, this wow. week's record they were doing some remote hack and stuff it was yuck yeah. I'll admit I love that show, but I am so far behind on every damn <laughs> podcast right now. Yeah. Like I figure I'll work from home. I'll listen to podcasts all day. Part of the problem is Yana can't we we now have it set up so we work in the same office, which maybe wasn't the best choice. It's great for some collaborative stuff, but not others. Um part of the problem is she can't stand listening to a podcast at anything but one time speed. I can't stand listening to a podcast at one time speed. So I just don't put on podcasts. So she'll be out of the room and I'll put one on at three times, then she'll come in and complain and I'll turn it off. And I get like half an episode listen. Like I really thought I'd catch up. You what I should do? The podcast on the computer. Yeah. <laughs> that oh, way you can use, your, that way you can use the headphones. I think, I think at this point I should just wipe and start fresh. Yeah, and at least then I'll be hearing current stuff because I'm at like uh, Origins hasn't happened yet in my <laughs> podcast. Here, so. Oops. All right. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we are going to have to lock the front doors and kick y'all out. So the doors to the lobby are closed. You can always find us across the web and social media at Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Uh, if you like what we're doing here at all, head over to Tabletop Bellhop or sorry, patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop, and please consider tipping the bellhop. And yes, we are going to revise our Patreon. It is going to happen sometime. All the work's done. We are just waiting for something that we're going to be talking about in the after show tonight. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Fridays at 8.30 p.m. where we mostly play Gloomhaven, but now and then we'll surprise you with something else. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. And be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on.